when God pr proposed to make a covenant with ancient Israel, they were so, so excited and awestruck. Even when they heard the terms of the covenant, they said, all, and we note that word, all that the Eternal has said, we will do and be obedient. That is a quote from, from Exodus 24 and verse 7. Now God, com God commanded their, their attitude. And note what God said to Moses. These words are recorded in Deuteronomy chapter 5. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 28. Breaking into the verse, we read, I have heard the voice of this people, which they have spoken to me. They have said well, all that they have spoken. And notice what he's continued to say here. Would that this heart of theirs be would, like, would be like this always, to fear me and to keep all my commandments, that it might be well with them and with their sons forever. So God's saying, you know, would that their heart be with me like this? Would they stay in this frame of mind? God's desire for them was to maintain th this commitment. However, Israel, when faced with trials, which tested their, com their commitment to the covenant, time and time again, failed to follow through. They did not have what it takes. They did not have the strength to do what God had wanted them to do. One of the things God told us when we were called was that the way that we were about to choose was not going to be an easy one. Back then, whenever that time were, whenever that time was, we heard the sound of those words. We understood what was said, at least on an intellectual level. And just as Israel did, we pledged our obedience. Yet how much are we like ancient Israel in our response to the various trials that test our commitment to the covenant we made at baptism? Christians today are not unique in their reaction to various trials. We read in the scriptures of the doubts, the questions, and even the emotional turbulence experienced in the face of trials by all of God's servants down through history. But without exception, all of God's true servants ultimately endured obediently and faithfully whatever God allowed them to go through. They endured. So as the perils of the times we are living in continue to increase, let's take a look at some of the lessons we can learn from God's faithful servants. God has recorded these things, has recorded these things for us to learn, for us to ponder on these things. So let's look and see what we can learn from the things that they had to endure the things that these individuals had to learn in overcoming the trials they face in order to endure to the end. Now let's first define our terms here and we're going to define what endurance means. For the, uh, for the purposes of, uh, for, of our discussion today, endurance is simply the ability to persevere in a task or a calling. The ability to persevere in a task or a calling, which means you're going to see to the end what you have been given, the calling, the task, whatever the responsibility is. And of course, in the context, God's calling, God's responsibility, what God has called us to. But first, let's go back and examine some of the cautions Christ gave his disciples anyone who would become his disciples. Let's note in Luke chapter 14. Let's turn back to Luke chapter 14 and verse 25. Luke 14 and verse 25. 
It says, and, and there went great multitudes with him. And he turned and said unto them, If any one come to me, and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yes, even his own life cannot be my disciple. Verse 27, whoever does not bear his execution stake, or cross as it says here, and come after me cannot be my disciple. You see here, Christ laying out specific responsibilities, specific caveats that we ought to be aware of, that everyone who entered this path must be aware of. It says, if you don't do these things, you cannot be my disciple. Continue on in verse 28. For which of you intending to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has sufficient funds to finish it? Lest perhaps after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to, to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king does not first sit down and consult whether he, he is able with 10,000 to meet him that comes against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is yet a way, great way off, he sends an ambassador and desired conditions of peace. Verse, verse 33. So then, Christ says, every one of you who does not abandon all his possessions is not able to be my disciple. From these verses, we can pick two basic, basic demands Christ made of his disciples. Number one, one's loyalty to him must come before loyalty to his family or even to life itself, even to his own life itself. Now, we know an example of that going back, all the way back to Abel. Abel had to make that choice. Abel had to choose his loyalty to God over his own life. And we knew the story. He is called Righteous Abel because he made the choice that he was willing to abandon everything, including his own life, to serve God. The second thing basic demands Christ makes you there, here is one must carry his own execution stake and follow Christ. This means this is making the ultimate commitment where there can be no turning back. We are going to follow Christ to the death. Now, all of us, as I said earlier, all of us read these words from the beginning when we came to understand, and we came to understand what they meant, at least at some basic elementary level. And just as ancient Israel, we were willing to make a commitment we, in effect, said, again, as ancient Israel, all that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient. We promised to be obedient, even if it meant giving up our physical lives. That is what we promised to do. That is the commitment we made. God has given us ears to hear. He has given us the understanding he has also given us the means to follow through on our commitment. Now along the way, though there were many things we would encounter, we didn't quite expect. We didn't quite understand some of the things we would encounter as time goes on. But God has given us all that we need to fulfill our commitment. We counted the cost, at least we thought we did, and we accepted the invitation to become a disciple of Jesus Christ. But human nature at times, and I'd say most or all of the times, human nature at times refuses to, refuses and have a hard time accepting God at his word. These things, carnally speaking, are difficult to accept to the human mind. We might say in the back of our minds, 
certainly. He can't really mean that. Can he? Well, God means what he says. Christ meant what he said when he, when he told his disciples that we must be, be willing to abandon everything to be his disciples. Let's look at one of those the scripture where we find it hard again to accept. In 1 Peter chapter 4, this is one of those things that again, we, the Bible says yes, and we say, well, we're not quite sure of that. 1 Peter 4 and verse 12, Peter writes, he loved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes, to, when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Now here, Peter tells God's people, don't be surprised. And guess what? We are surprised when things happen. It seems like out of the blue. But we are warned ahead of time, don't be surprised. Human reason has a default mechanism which does or things contrary to what it says in scripture. If it says, don't be surprised, sure enough, we were surprised that something that's supposed to happen rarely happens. But how then did God's servants endure? What were some of the lessons they had to learn? The first lesson that we're going to examine today is, is number one, the first lesson they had to learn is they accepted sore trials as part of their calling. God's servants accepted sore trials as part of their calling. Let's notice in Genesis chapter 45, we're quite familiar with the story of Joseph, but let's just pick out a few verses here to to show the reality of the situation. Genesis 45 and verse 3. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph. Does my father yet live? You can imagine the shock that they heard, that came upon them when they heard those words after knowing what they have done earlier. And his brethren could not answer him. They were in shock, for they were troubled at his presence. And Joseph said unto his, his brothers, Come near to me, I, I, be, I pray you. And they came near. And he said, again, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Now therefore, do not be grieved nor angry with yourself that you sold me there. For God did set me before you to preserve life. For these two years has the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in which there shall be neither, neither be airing or harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth, to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now, it was not you that sent me here, but God. And he had made me a father to Pharaoh and all his house and the ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. We find here something very important. That Joseph came to understand that God was guiding and directing his life. All the many years, and we don't have time to go through that. You can read that on your own. All the many years of agony and turmoil and temptations he had come to accept, he had come to accept as being under the guiding hand of God. God was molding and shaping him to fulfill a responsibility not only in his lifetime, not only in this lifetime, but for all eternity. And indeed, not only for his lifetime, but also for those that would follow, could learn from his example. All the trials that he had gone through 
played an integral part in the process that God was doing. Let's notice again what Christ told his disciples back in Luke. Get all your place in Genesis. We're going to get back there in a minute. Let's start off to Luke. Luke 13. Luke 13 and verse 24. Luke 13, verse 24. Jesus told his disciples, strive, or the, the, the word can be literally translated, keep on striving. It says, strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. The word that's translated striving here is the word from which the English word agony is derived. So we see then that the struggle to enter in must be so intense that it can be, strived, it can be described as an agony of our whole being. We must be straining every ounce of every nerve, every fiber of our being to enter. As Jesus said, Jesus Christ told his disciples, strive to enter in at the straight or narrow gate. And we notice from the last part of that verse that we just read that Christ also said that no one can get through this narrow gate without authorization. No one. But once we have been given authorization, brethren, we must understand it's not a free pass. We don't just ease down the road, so to speak. We must realize it takes great effort it takes struggle to get through this gate. The way through this gate is compressed. It is narrow as a gorge between high rocks. The way that leads to life involves straits and difficulties. Now we can go back to Genesis. We're not going to read all of it, but we can go, we can read of all the struggles Joseph had to go through. When at age 17, he was abducted by his brothers and sold into slavery. So here was Joseph. He went from being the most favorite son in his father's household to being cast out and becoming property to a stranger. Now his physical life was under the control of someone else. They determined when he would go in and when he would go out. And in addition, he had to deal with another common struggle. This struggle was forced upon him. This struggle is described in James chapter 1. Let's, let's see that. And it's a struggle every human being has to go through. James 1 and verse 13. James 1 and verse 13 says, Let no one, this is James is giving us a caution here. Let no one, when he is tempted, when no, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. James is warning God's people. Let no one say this. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each one is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desires. We note what it says here. Each one is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desires. And when desire conceives, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is full grown, it gives birth to death. This was a struggle everyone has to go through. This was a struggle that Joseph had thrust upon him. But let's notice the focus of Joseph's mind. In the midst of the struggle against the temptations of Potiphar's wife, in Genesis chapter 39, Genesis chapter 39 and verse 9, Genesis 39 and verse 9, Joseph says, No one in this house is greater than I. 
and he has not withheld anything from me except you, because you are his wife. And notice where Joseph's focus is. He says, and how should I do this great evil and sin against God? We find here, Joseph made no excuses. He had no rationalization. He did not allow himself to be dragged off and enticed by the bait of his own desires. Joseph truly struggled to get in through that narrow door. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life can keep us from entering into that gate and prevent us from staying on the straight and narrow way. Joseph did not allow these things to overtake him. This is something we must be aware of. In spite of all his, the struggles he goes through, in spite of all the temptations, his focus was on God. Let's notice what the psalmist says in Psalm 37. Psalm 37 and verse 7. Psalm 37 and, and verse 7. This is from the New American Standard rendering. It says, rest, or other translation says, be still. Rest, or be still in the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. This is instruction to us. This is what we have to understand. This is what we have to consider when we are going through these things. Verse 8. Instructions to, to us says, Cease from anger. Or that can also be translated, let go of anger. This is one of the most difficult things for us to do. How, how easy it is for Joseph to hold on to his anger. But God tells us to cease from anger or let go of it. And forsake wrath. Or the translation have abandoned rage. Do not fret. And the word fret means to kindle. You see, so if you translate that literally, it means do not kindle yourself do not, or do not be annoyed. God says do not fret or kindle yourself. It only causes harm. It only causes harm. We're only hurting ourselves. But let's notice what Joseph told his brothers back in Genesis 50. Genesis 50 and verse 20. He had learned a few things through his lifetime. All this, all the experience he went through took time. And he had to learn, just as we also have to learn these lessons. Genesis 50 and verse 20. But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. In order to bring about it, in order to bring it about as it is this day, to save many people alive. That was God's purpose. That was God's intention. Joseph did not know this in the beginning, but God revealed it to him. That was the purpose for his trials. Joseph learned the experiences that he went through were God's will for him. How about us? Are we learning from these experiences? Let's notice in Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14. And this is something that we've no doubt read many times. Acts chapter 14, verse 21. Acts 14 and verse 21. And having announced the gospel to that city, speaking of uh, Paul, 
and Barnabas here. And having announced the gospel to that city, and having made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and Iconium and Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples, exhorting them, encouraging them to continue in the faith. And notice what it says here at the last part of this verse. And that through many tribulations we must enter into the kingdom of God. This is what Jesus Christ said earlier. We must strive to enter into the narrow gate. We must agonize. Paul, Paul is again teaching, confirming, encouraging the brethren that with, through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Paul understood that tribulations, trials, and afflictions are part and parcel of a Christian's lot. And we note here he was very honest, open, and forthright. He was not going in any way to sugarcoat the realities of a Christian life. This, is, this was not a feel-good type situation Paul was saying here. He was, not, he was going to follow the example of how Jesus Christ taught his disciples. But let's note something further. In going back, Acts in the same chapter to verse 8. Acts 14 and verse 8. Now at Lystra there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. So we see here... It's amazing how many times we find out this man couldn't walk. Three re references to the fact this man couldn't walk. He could not use his feet, he was crippled from birth, and he, was never, and he has never walked. So we see the situation here. This individual had never walked. Verse 9. He listened to Paul speaking, and Paul looked intently at him, and seeing he had the faith to be made well, Paul was given the gift of discernment with this individual. Verse 10. Said in a loud voice, stand up on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. Now the healing of this lame man at Lystra, it resulted in the people attempting to worship Paul and Barnabas. They had never witnessed so spectacular, something so spectacular right before their eyes. One who was lame from birth was now walking. What a tremendous thing that was. Let's drop down to verse uh, 19. But, but something happened. Acts 14 and verse 19, but Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. Notice how fickle these people were. It wasn't too long when they were ready to offer sacrifices to Paul and Barnabas. Now they have come under the influence of the prince of the power of the air. The Jews stir up opposition and stone Paul. Continuing in verse 20, Howbeit, as the disciples stood around him, he rose up. Obviously, God was with him. This is Paul. He rose up and came into the city. And the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. And when he had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch. We see here Paul was undaunted. He didn't let what the Jews did to him turn him away so, so we find here that they, Paul and Barnabas escaped the derby 
where they continued to preach and to teach many of those God was working with. Now, when Paul relayed to the disciples, as we read earlier in verse 22, that it was through many tribulations that Christians will enter into the kingdom of God, he was speaking from personal experience. And now, Paul was not some armchair general, so to speak, commanding his troops to go out to the front line. Meanwhile, he stays back into the safety of his bunker, well protected. Paul was on the front lines doing the work of God. He learned from experience. God has recorded for us the many tribulations Paul had to endure, and he knew it was for his benefit, even though it was very painful. We know here Paul is writing to his son in the faith, Timothy. Let's note in 2 Timothy chapter 3, here's what Paul wrote to Timothy. He, he's recounting here some of the things he had experienced, some of the things that we just read about. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 10. Paul writes, but you have closely followed my doctrine, the conduct, the purpose, the faith, the long-suffering, the love, the patient endurance, the persecutions, the sufferings, such as happened to me in Antioch, in Iconium, in Lystra. What persecutions I bore. And we just read about those. Paul was stoned, dragged out the city. And notice what Paul said, and the Lord delivered me out of all. Where did Paul get his deliverance from? God. God delivered him. This wasn't anything that he did. Verse 12. Notice what he goes on to say here. And indeed, all desiring to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. This is a dogmatic statement Paul makes here. But how many of us understand the reality of this statement? Now, the problem is we always think, think of persecution. We, ha we always have this scenario in our minds, what it means to be persecuted. But persecutions can come in various forms. And sometimes we do not always recognize it for what it is. We can be easily tripped up. We may have our ideas of deliverance, but it is God's will that must be done. Paul strove to help the brethren keep the trials they were experiencing in perspective. Let's go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Paul continues to encourage and teach the brethren. First Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 17. But brothers, this is from the New International Version, but brothers, when we were torn away from you for a short time, in person, not in, not in thought, out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you, Paul goes on. For we wanted to come to you. Certainly, I, Paul, did again and again. But Satan stopped, or the translation of hindered us. For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we, in, in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? This was Paul's focus on serving and allowing them to grow and to develop, to fulfill their responsibility so that they can have, they can partake of that crown that was reserved for them. Paul said what, that is what he was looking forward for these individuals. Verse 20, indeed, you, indeed, you are, you are our glory and joy. Chapter 3 and verse 1, continuing. So when, we, but so when we could stand it no longer, we thought it best 
to be left by ourselves in, in, in Athens. We send a, a Timothy, who is our brother and, and God's fellow worker in spreading the gospel of Christ. What did Paul, what was Paul's intention? Notice what he said here, to strengthen and encourage you in the faith so that no one would be unsettled by these trials. As we well know, trials can be very unsettling. But Paul says that Paul's goal to send Timothy was to strengthen and encourage them. You know quite well that we were destined for them. That is trials. So in all of his labors, the Apostle Paul always kept the end in view, he kept the goal in sight. His aim was to prevent every man perfect in Christ. He prayed for this. He toiled for this. He reminded the church in Thessalonica that they knew quite well, as we just read, they knew quite well that they that they were destined to encounter trials. Now this knowledge must go beyond mere acknowledgement to acceptance. Trials are but temporary experiences ordained by God as a means to an end. The end that God has in mind for all of his children. David understood this. Let's note what he writes in Psalm 34. Psalm 34, verse 19. Psalm 34 and verse 19. David writes, Many... He didn't say here a few or once in a while. It says, many are the afflictions of the righteous. But notice what he continues. But the Lord delivers him out of them all. Again, David understood from experience that even those God considered righteous are not immune from trials and afflictions. The second area, the second lesson that we need to learn in order to endure is that it didn't matter how sore the trials became. All of God's servants never lost hope. They never lost hope. They never gave up. They never threw their hands up and walked away from what God has given, had given them. Proverbs 24, let's note what it says here. Proverbs 24 and verse 10. It says, if you faint, and the word translated faint means give way to discouragement and despair, to be disheartened. So this says, if you faint, if you give way to discouragement and despair in the day of adversity, Adversity means a time of trial or temptation. So this proverb tells us, if you faint in the day of adversity, in the time of trial or temptation, your strength is small. Relying on human strength alone is a sure way to give in to discouragement. But even understanding where this strength came from did not always give God's servants the immediate comfort when, he, when they were in the midst of trials. Sometimes they have to wait. Notice in Psalm, verse 43, it's Psalm, first, ver, it's Psalm 43 and verse 1. It says, judge me, or does translation says, Vindicate me, O God, and strive for my cause against a nation that is not godly. Deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man, for you are the God of my strength. No, the psalmist acknowledged that God was the God of his strength. 
There is no other source of strength. But yet, no, notice what he continues to say. Why have you cast me off? Why do I go mourning when the enemy oppresses? So we see here, even though the psalmist understood where his strength came from, he wonders why he has been abandoned in the midst of affliction. Of course, he was not been abandoned, but our human perspective caused us to feel that way. When in the midst of trials and affliction, these questions always seem to overwhelm everything else. You know. We want things to happen right away. We want things to take care of yesterday, so to speak. But let's just look at an example of one who, whose strength at times was at his limits. And yet he endured because he never lost hope. This was God's prophet, Jeremiah. Let's notice in Jeremiah 37. In Jeremiah 37, verse 1. Jeremiah 37 and verse 1. And King Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, reigned instead of Coniah, the son of Je Jehoiakim, whose, whom Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, made king in the land of Judah. But neither he nor his servants nor the people in the land did listen to the words of the Eternal, which he spoke by the prophet Jeremiah. We see something important here. They didn't pay attention to what Jeremiah was saying. And Zedekiah the king sent Jehuchal, the son of Shelemiah, and Zephaniah the son of Maaseah, the priest to the prophet Jeremiah, saying, Pray now to the Lord God for us comes with a request. Now, Jeremiah came in and went out among the people, for they had not put him into, in prison. Then Pharaoh's army was come forth out of Egypt. And when the Chaldeans that besieged Jerusalem heard tidings of them, they departed from Jerusalem. We see here this message of Jeremiah occurred during the siege of Jerusalem by the, by the Chaldeans. The, the Chaldeans, upon hearing the news of the approach of the Egyptian troops, temporarily raised the siege of Jerusalem. Let's continue to read to the message of Jeremiah in verse 6. Then the word of the Eternal came to the prophet Jeremiah, saying, Thus said the eternal God of Israel, Thus shall you say to the king of Judah that sent you to inquire of me. So God here instructs Jeremiah what he should say to the king. Behold, Pharaoh's army which is coming forth to help you shall return to Egypt, to their own land. And the Chaldeans shall come again and fight against this city and take it and burn it with fire. Thus said the Lord, do not deceive yourself, saying, The Chaldeans shall surely depart from us, for they shall not depart. For though you had smitten the whole army of the Chaldeans that fight against you, and there shall remain but wounded men among them, yet they should rise up every man in his tent and burn the city with fire. So what was... Jeremiah's message to the king that the relief of, of Jerusalem was only temporary. And what the Chaldeans were doing would, would ultimately change nothing. Jerusalem would be destroyed, as he said in verse 10. Jerusalem would be destroyed. Let's drop down to verse 13. And when he had reached the Benjamin gate, the captain of the guard, whose name of Elijah, son of Shalemiah, the son of Hananiah, arrested him and said, You are deserting to the Babylonians. Now here is someone given a message from God 
Now he's been accused of being a traitor. Verse 14, that's not true, Jeremiah said. I am not deserting to the Babylonians, but Elijah would not listen to him. Instead, he arrested Jeremiah and brought him to the officials. They were angry with Jeremiah and had him beaten and imprisoned him in the house of Jonathan the secretary, which they had made into a prison. Jeremiah was put into a vaulted cell in a dungeon where he, where he remained for a long time. So this is the experience of one of God's true servants. He was faithfully fulfilling the responsibilities that he was given. And what happens? He gets beaten, thrown in a dungeon, where he remains for a while. Continuing in verse 18, Then Jeremiah said to King Zedekiah, What crime have I committed against you, or your officials, or these people, to have me put in, this, in prison? Where are the prophets who prophesied to you? The king of Babylon will not attack you or this land. But now, my Lord, please listen. Let me bring my petition before you. Do not send me back to the house of Jonathan the secretary, or there I will die. Jeremiah knew what fate awaited him if he was sent back. And here we find him pleading his case before the king. Continue on in chapter 38. And let's just listen to the words of Jeremiah because they're very eloquent to see the, de the dedication of this individual, this prophet of God. In, in Jeremiah 38 and verse 1, then Shepathiah, the son of Matan, and Gedaliah, the son of Pashur, and Jukal, the son of Shelemiah, and Pashur, the son of Malchiah, heard the words that Jeremiah had spoken unto all the people, saying, These are the words that Jeremiah was speaking to the people. Thus said the Lord. After all he had gone through, Jeremiah wouldn't quit. He wouldn't give up. He continued to tell them, This is what the Lord said. Verse 2, Thus said the Lord, he that remains in this city shall die by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence. But he, shall, he that go forth to the Chaldeans shall live, for he shall save his life for a prey, and shall live. Thus said the Lord, this is the, again from God, instructions from God that he is given. Thus said the Lord, this city shall surely be given into the hand of the king of Babylon's army, which he shall take it. So Jeremiah, he's undaunted. Nothing is going to stop him. He continues to fulfill the responsibilities that he is given. We find here Jeremiah the message was heard by four high-ranking officials who demanded the king put him to death. Note in chapter 38 and verse 5. Verse 5. King Zedekiah said, this is what the king said, Behold, he is in your hands, for the king can do nothing against you. These individuals demanded the king hand over Jeremiah for his treasonous, treasonous remarks. Let's note what the Jeremiah, what, the, what those rulers, officials said. Let's drop back up to verse 4. Therefore the princes said unto the king, We beseech you, we urge you, let, us, let this man be put to death. For thus he weakens the hand of the man of war that remains in the city and the hand of all the people in speaking such words unto them. For this man does not seek the welfare of this people, but their hurt. So they, the king gave Jeremiah over to them. 
And verse 6, so they took Jeremiah, cast him into the cistern of Malchiah, the king's son, which was in the court of the God, letting Jeremiah down by the rope, ropes. There was no water in the cistern, but only mud. And Jeremiah sank in the mud. Here we find, brethren, Jeremiah's life at stake. Now, had the water or mud been deeper in the cistern, he would surely have drowned or suffocated. And now death by starvation was a near prospect. What was Jeremiah's reaction to, this, to the destruction of Jerusalem? In addition to his own trials, not only is he tell him the, telling them that this is what God says, but he's, he's experiencing trials. They're taking him and beating him for what he's doing. They're taking him and throwing him into prison, risking his own life. But what was his reaction? He was no doom and gloom prophet preaching destruction without any personal involvement, as we see here. Jeremiah identified with God, with Jerusalem and its people. He bore their heavy burdens. He was filled with love and compassion for the people that were being chastened. But we notice, brethren, God did not isolate Jeremiah from the afflictions his people were suffering. Let's note some of the words of Jeremiah in his afflictions. Go over the next book to Lamentations. Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 1. Je Jeremiah writes, I am the man who has seen affliction under the rod of his wrath. Now, people, or there are those who would like to consign this as a poetic elegy because of the way it's structured. This is, this is a very, this book is structured as a Hebrew acrostic. But this is Jeremiah living, telling of his experience, what he was feeling, as also what the nation of, of Judah, the people of Jerusalem, what they were going through. It says, I am the man who has seen affliction under the rod of his wrath. He had driven and brought me into darkness without any light. Surely against me he's turned my hand. He's turned his hand again and again the whole day long. Verse 4, he has made my flesh and my skin waste away. He has broken my bones. He has besieged and enveloped me with bitterness and tribulation. He has made me dwell in darkness like the dead of long ago. He has walled me around so that I cannot escape. He has made my chains heavy. Though I cry for help, he shuts out my prayer. These are the words of the prophet Jeremiah, the prophet that God chose from a very young age to take a message to his people, a prophet that was full of compassion, a prophet that God allowed to experience all this that Jeremiah just says here. Now, earlier in his book, you don't have to turn there, but Jeremiah had cried out to God in desperation when he made this complaint. You can read this in Jeremiah 20 and verse 7. We just, we just read this. Jeremiah 20 and verse 7, where Jeremiah said, oh, oh Lord, O oh eternal God, you have deceived me when I was deceived. You are stronger than I, and you have prevailed. I have become a laughingstock all the day. Everyone mocks me, for whenever I speak, I cry out. I shout, violence and destruction. Jeremiah was filled with, with, with what he was seeing around him. He was filled with the indignation of God. For the word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and a derision all day long. And as we saw earlier, it became a derision. 
when they took him and threw him into the, into the pit. And notice what he says here in Jeremiah 20 and verse 9. If I say I will not mention him or speak any more of his name, there is in my heart as if it were a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I am weary with holding it. I cannot. Jeremiah was totally consumed in doing the work he was given to do. And, and any thought of quitting was simply out of the question. He will not do it. He will not entertain it. Even, even, even though he said, I will not mention his name, but then notice what he said here. There is in my heart, as it were, a fire burning within me. There was a fire that was burning inside of him, which he would not quench. In his affliction, he felt overwhelmed and poured out his complaint before God. And we read these in Jeremiah's own words. He was also overwhelmed at the destruction of Jerusalem that res and, and also by the sin of the people that brought about the, dis the suffering and resulted from the destruction. But note, in, again, in Jeremiah's world, this goes back to Lamentations, or stay there if you never left. Lamentations, chapter 3 and verse 18. Let's note, in his words, the depth of despair he had sunk to. Lamentations 3, verse 18. So I say, my endurance has perished. So has my hope from the Lord. This is what he said. All hope appeared gone. Now when things look bleak in our lives, one of the first pieces of the spiritual armor the adversary ferociously attacks is the helmet of the hope of salvation. That is one of the first things he goes after because that helmet protects our head. It protects our thoughts. And all this stress and, and trials that Jeremiah had gone through and seeing what was happening, it affected him. However, even though his helmet, so to speak, took a battering, in spite of all the battering that it took, he refused to get he refused to let go. Jeremiah held on for their life. Verse 21, this was the key to his survival. This I recall to mind, therefore have I hope. The key to his survival was remembering that the God that he served was the true God. It was this God who had called him and given him the opportunity to come to know him and to serve him with wholehearted and obedience. But one thought, though, as we read this, crowded out the hopelessness that threatened to overwhelm him. In the depths of his distress, he called to mind, so to speak, something that propelled him forward. Notice what was that. Verse 22. It is of the Lord's mercy that we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. We find here it is because of the mercy and steadfast love of God that we are not all consumed. Because brethren, we, under we understand, God has given us the understanding that God and the word from the very beginning made a commitment to reproduce themselves, to build a family. God's will is going to be done due to the fact that his supply of loyal love and compassion is not limited. We read in Psalm 145, verse 8, David understood this. This is the Psalm of David. Psalm 145 and verse 8, David wrote, The eternal is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and great in loyal love. The eternal is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all of these, his works. 
These things came to Jeremiah's mind in the midst of his turmoil and anguish. He came to a deeper understanding of the mercy and faithfulness of God. Back in Lamentations 3 and verse 26, Lamentations 3 verse 26 continuing, we see the fog begins to lift. And Jeremiah says, It is good that a man hopes for the salvation of the eternal, even in silence. This verse, brethren, focuses on the critical quality we need to endure, to persevere in the tasks we have been given, and to do, and the tasks we have been given to do, and the calling to which we have been given. That critical quality, brethren, is hope. True hope is not a pacifying wish of the imagination which drowns out our trouble, troubles. And that's a wishful, we don't sit around wishing, so to speak, and hoping in a false sense. True, that is not true hope. True hope is not uncertain, but rather hope is the solid of expectation for the righteous. It is solid. Hope is a positive expectation for the future, but it is directed solely towards God. So we find here in the depths of despair, Jeremiah never fainted. He never gave up. He never lost hope. Why? Because of his relationship with God. He knew God. God has given him this gift, the helmet of the hope and of salvation. For Jeremiah, this piece of spiritual armor, along with all the other pieces, was in full working condition. In Lamentations, verse 3, chapter, chapter 3 and verse 31, we continue to read, But eternal will not cast us off forever. For though he causes grief, yet... He will have compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. God never abandoned his people. This was the living hope that gave Jeremiah the strength that he needed to continue. This was the hope that gave Jeremiah the strength that he needed. Let's notice Paul writes in about this hope in Hebrews chapter 6. In Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 18. Hebrews 6 and verse 18 says, So by, by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. Notice Paul said, Hold fast to that hope. Hold fast. And notice he goes on. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner part of the curtain. We see here God has given us this hope. The hope that God has given us is the same hope that Jeremiah clung to in the midst of his despair. And, and as Paul describes this hope here as an anchor, now imagine a ship with its anchor cast down in the stormy seas. The ship will toss to and fro, turbulent waters. Water may even come over the sides, over the bow, but with a strong and trustworthy anchor firmly attached, it will not go adrift. Brethren, we must be anchored to this hope, as Paul brings out, if we are not anchored within the veil, that is the one who has gone through the veil, that is Jesus Christ, we have no hope. The next thing we want to look at is another essential quality of those that allow those brethren, those servants of God to endure trials, is that they live by faith. They live by faith. Let's notice in, in the Let's go to the minor prophets here in Habakkuk chapter 1. In Habakkuk 
chapter 1 and verse 1. This is some instructions that was given to a prophet of God. Habakkuk 1 and verse 1. This is the message that the prophet Habakkuk received in the vision. This is from the New Living Translation. How long, O Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen. So we find here another theme, a similar theme that Jeremiah had. This prophet was looking at what was going on in Judah. This prophet was looking at what, was, what he was seeing around him. And he said, how long must I call for help? But you do not listen. Notice what he says here. Violence is everywhere. Does that sound familiar? I cry, but you do not come to save. Must I see all these, all these evil deeds? Why must I watch all this misery? Wherever I look, I see destruction and violence. I am surrounded by people who love to argue and fight. The law has become paralyzed, and there is no justice in the courts. The wicked far outnumber the righteous, so that justice has become perverted. So we find here then the prophet Habakkuk was a man of deep convictions and emotions, not unlike Jeremiah, and was deeply troubled by what he saw going on around him. Now the inquiries that Habakkuk made of God has been echoed by many of God's servants down through the ages. He cried out to God, how long? How long? In Revelation 6 and verse 9, you don't have the term there. In Revelation 6 verse 9 we read, When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slaughtered for the word of God and because of the testimony which they had. And they cried out with a long voice, How long, holy and true Lord, will you not judge and avenge your blood from those who live on the earth? So we find here this theme is, has been echoed by many of God's servants. Habakkuk was living at a time very much like the times that we are living in today. As a matter of fact, if we would take the words that we just read from Habakkuk, there would be nothing that he would have to change if he would be speaking these words today. Violence is everywhere, he said. The law has become paralyzed. Isn't that the, the society that we live in today? The wicked far outnumber the righteous, so that justice has become perverted. So we see here that Habakkuk was distressed. But God gave him some encouragement. But God told him, things that were going to happen. Let's notice Habakkuk 2 and verse 2. After he asked questions of God, God answered him and says, And the Lord answered me, Write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so that he who run may read. For the vision awaits it, its appointed time. It hastens to the end, it will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come, it will not delay. God is giving Habakkuk specific instructions. The vision that I'm giving you is going to come to pass. But Habakkuk is also told that the vision that he is instructed to record it will be fulfilled precisely on time, not a moment too early or too late. The vision will be absolutely true and absolutely certain of fulfillment. Though it may seem, it is being delayed. Verse 4. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright in him, but the righteous shall live by faith. God gives Habakkuk his summary condemnation of the conceited character of the Babylonians. Notice what he says here. He is puffed up with pride. He's puffed up. Pride's puffs up. He's puffed up. He is swollen with his evil desires. His desires are not upright. Now the word that's translated upright 
It literally, literally means to be straight, to be level. And it's used here as a means that this individual cannot be trusted. We, we are familiar with the terminology, he's not on the level. Well, this is, of course, a reference to the beast at the end time. But this is also a reference to the time that Habakkuk lived to the Chaldeans. So on the one hand are the proud. They are puffed up. They live by their own self-sufficiency. They rely on themselves. Let's keep in mind, brethren, the admonition of Jesus Christ to those to his end time church who say they have need of nothing. This is the attitude that God is, is telling Habakkuk this, these individuals have. And of course, it refers to the end time. So on the one hand, we have those who are proud. On the other hand, as we read in verse 4, we have the actions of ad and attitudes of those who are righteous. They live by faith. It is what they stake their lives on. We see here then that there is relationship between one who is righteous and one who lives by faith. These two brethren are inseparable. You cannot separate them. You can't have one without the other. Let's notice instruction Christ gave to his disciple in Luke 18. You all are quite familiar with this parable, but let's, let's read a few verses here. It says, Luke 18 and verse 1. And he spoke a parable to them to this end that men ought always to pray and not faint. That word faint is very interesting. It means to lose one's motivation to accomplish some valid goal. To lose one's motivation to accomplish some valid goal. To become discouraged. To lose heart. To give up. Brethren, is this a picture of those who have allowed the helmet of the hope of salvation to become compromised? So we're going to see how the, the, the critical relationship between hope and faith. One goes into the other. They, they're related to each other. Like righteousness and faith are, are also interrelated. And Christ goes on to, to tell about this widow who beseech this judge for help. And we see in verses 5 and 6 that this judge was only concerned about himself. Notice what he said. Because this widow has troubled me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. He was only concerned about himself. Jesus has managed his disciples to hear what the unjust judge says. In Hebrews 6 and verse 10, Hebrews 6 verse 10, it says, For God is not just. For God is not unjust. So as to forget your work, and the love which you have demonstrated for his name, having served the saints and continue to serve them. So we see here any, so we see here the contrast that Jesus Christ is making. The, the attitude of the unjust judge and God is poles apart. It is as far as the east is from the, as far as the east is from the West. As Paul writes, God is not unjust. Yet Christ warned his disciples about the critical lack of faith that will be extant around the time of his return. As he said in verse 8, I tell you, he will av avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, here's the question Christ asked, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? The question, brethren, we need to consider. Did Christ pose this question to the world in general? Or was this to his disciples in particular? This question was addressed to his disciples. 
and focus our attention on the conditions among us, the end time. Let's notice Paul writes in Hebrews 10 and verse 35. Paul is admonishing the brethren. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has great reward, for you have need of endurance, in order that after you have done the will of God, you may receive what have promised. Notice this. After you have done the will of God, he must first do the will of God. For yet a little while, and the one who is coming will, not, will come and will not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith. This is what we read earlier, Habakkuk, Habakkuk was told. This is a quote from Habakkuk that we just read. But notice the warning Paul leaves. And if he shrinks back, my soul is not pleased with him. See, Paul brings to the attention the absolute need for God's people to have endurance. And by the very definition of the word, as we covered earlier, we must persevere in what God has given us to do. That is the will of God in order to receive the promises. But day by day, all of God's righteous ones must live by faith. This faith is not only the absolute trust in God and his word, but it is the faith of Jesus Christ, which God gives to those he's working with. This is the gift from God. God gives it, but we must exercise it. It must be utilized. So we have a choice, brethren. Here's the choice we face. It's very simple. Either we are living by faith or we are living by sight. If we are not living by faith, we are in grave danger of shrinking back, as Paul brings out here, or drawing back from the commitment we made at baptism. Brethren, we must always keep in mind what we have promised. A spiritual Israel, we quoted earlier, Spiritual Israel, physical Israel said, we also said, in effect, all that the Lord does do, all as the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. But unlike ancient Israel, God has given us the power to follow through on our commitment. But we must use this power. We must exercise this power. If we do, we will learn to endure. The lessons will be hard, but we must learn. But notice the promise that awaits all those who endure. Matthew 24 and verse 13. It is an exciting promise. Matthew 24 and verse 13. In the midst of the Olivet prophecy, Christ tells his disciples, but the one who endures to the end. Notice what he says here. The one who endures to the end, this person will be saved. 